to review and maybe purchase and also uh, Homeward Publishing Min Ministries have some books there for you to review. And then I'm going to tell each one of you at the end of the seminar, we also will be giving a book away at the end tonight. I want to also welcome the online guests that we have watching. And at this time, I'd like to have Barbara come up and we will say a little word of prayer. Welcome. I want to, for us to bow our heads, loving Father in heaven, thank you that Barbara O'Neill can come and share with us, help us to hear what we need to hear to apply in our own lives, and help us to have the courage to put it into practice so that we can soon meet our Lord in the, and be ready for his heavenly kingdom. I thank you. Amen. Thank you for coming. Amen. Thank you. So welcome tonight, everyone. Tonight we're going to be talking about our immune system. A lot of people say if they get a cold, it's because their immune system was low. You've heard that? Do you know it's not actually true? When you get a cold, it means you've got a strong immune system. And it was probably about 40 years ago that uh, the Common Cold Research Unit was set up in Salisbury, England to, try to find the cure, uh, the cause and the cure of the common cold. Okay, someone's got their lights on. Yes. Toyota yes. Uh, 7BL3040. So if anybody has a white older Toyota, their lights are on. So the Common Cold Research Unit was set up to find the cause and the cure of the common cold. So they would get people and they would um, put them in a hot shower, then put them straight outside in the cool wind, uh, they wouldn't get a cold. Then they got someone that had a cold and took some of the mucus from their throat, put it into the subject that they were testing, hot shower, put them out in the cold wind, didn't get a cold. In fact, after 40 years of trying to find the cause and the cure of the common cold, uh, the whole place had to be closed down because they will never find a cause and a cure for a common cold, because a cold is actually a house clean. Did you hear that? It's a house clean. So when you get a cold and you're blowing your nose and you're coughing up a whole lot of stuff, praise God. Amen. Where was it before you coughed it up? Where was it before you blew it out? And the body creates a lot of mucus, and that mucus helps to pull the waste and take it out of the body. And if you handle a cold aright, it will only last a few days and you'll actually be stronger and better because of the cold. Florence Nightingale, famous uh, British nurse who had an incredible effect to turn the tide of the deaths in the Crimean War, in fact, the death rate was 50% in the hospital when she got there. After two months, she got it down to 2%. What did she do? She increased the hygiene, sanitation and nutrition. And did you know that's why we don't have the childhood diseases around anymore like we used to? No, it's not vaccines. It's increasing hygiene, sanitation and nutrition. That's what turned the tide. And you can go to medical journals and you can see the graphs. I've got several books that have got the graphs in them. Ellen White, who wrote the book, The Ministry of Healing, she said, disease is an effort of nature to free the system from conditions that arise because of a violation of the basic laws of health. So what's the basic laws of health? You've got to know what they are so you know whether you're violating them or keeping them. It's pure air. We should be breathing in fresh air. Sunshine. I hope you're getting some of this lovely sunshine for your vitamin D. 
Temperance, that means don't take anything into the body that will harm it. And take in moderation the good things, that's common sense. The next one's rest, go to bed early, get a good night's sleep. Next one's exercise, it's pretty much common sense, isn't it? The next one's proper diet, just eat a plant-based diet, no, not refined, whole foods. Water, drink adequate water. And the eighth law is trust in divine power. When you trust in God, there's no need to fear or worry because stress compounds all illnesses. So when Ellen White says disease is an effort of nature to free the system from conditions that arise because of a violation of the laws of health, that makes sense. When someone gets a cold, it's time for a house clean. And after the break, we're going to go into some simple natural remedies that can, you, you can use to help with the house clean. In fact, when, when uh, Florence Nightingale read of Louis Pasteur's theory that germs cause disease, she said, this is the theory of a man of a very unstable mind. <laughs> and anyone who believes it is equally unstable. <laughs> because she said, and many agree, Germs don't cause disease, they're the result of unhealthful conditions. Did you know that in the mid-1800s, all the sewage from London went into the Thames and the people living in London drank the water out of the Thames? No wonder the Black Plague happened. So it was near the end of the of 1850s that this extensive sewage system was put under the streets of, of England. So your immune system, what is it? Well, I'm going to describe your immune system tonight so that after tonight you will never more puzzle what your immune system is. There's a proverb, it's Proverbs 14 verse 6, it says, knowledge is easy to him that understands. I want to give you an understanding of your immune system so you automatically have the knowledge on uh, how to treat it, how to strengthen it, how to weaken it. And in this crisis in the world at the moment, and I believe it is not a COVID crisis, it's an economic crisis because of an overreaction, that when you realise how the body heals and what it does, there's nothing to fear. And many people are fearing today, aren't they? I was in the train in Atlanta. We were packed in like sardines, as you are in the train in Atlanta, and over the loudspeaker it says, please everyone observe the two metre distance. <laughs> well, we're packed in like sardines. <laughs> A few people smiled. So what is your immune system? It's your defence system. It's your defence system against uh, disease, against invaders. So let's find out where it all begins. It begins with your skin. Your skin is like a suit of armour. And if ever you break open the skin in a cut or a graze, you, you got to be careful of that, don't you? Because now you've exposed the internal environment to possible pathogens, microbes. So we always either stitch the skin together, is that right? Or tape the skin together. We always clean it out. A friend of mine, she's a surgeon, she said we had a guy come in who had uh, a motorbike accident and he slid along the gravel. <laughs> so he had massive grazes with little bits of gravel and dirt in there. She said we put him under general anaesthetic, we poured sodium um, not sodium, um, pyroxide, hydrogen peroxide, and got a scrubbing brush. Eee. Aren't you glad he was under general anaesthetic? Because <laughs> they had to get that out. Because they didn't get all that dirt out, you know what's going to happen? Your internal immune system is going to come along and the, and the white blood cells are going to die and leave a lot of pus there and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there, there is a bit of common sense. Did you know that there's been a death and no one attended the funeral because no one knew he'd died? It was the death of common sense. <laughs> Isn't that true? 
It's time to revive it. It's not very common today. It's common sense. And that's something that God put in each one of us. That's why I believe we should be the doctors. So the skin. Skin does three things. Skin breathes. That's why be careful what you put on your skin. You don't want to block the breathing process. The skin throws off waste. And of course, we know when we perspire, that's what's happening. And the skin absorbs. So be careful what you're putting on your skin. And if there's a mouldy orange in the fruit bowl, please don't pick it up with your hand because you'll absorb some of those toxins. Now use some tongs, and by the way, put a mask on. There is a time for a mask so that you don't breathe in the, the dust because it's quite toxic. So the front line of defense is the skin. Now we're going to go to the head. And there are seven holes through that skin in your head. There are two ears, there are two eyes, there are two nostrils, and there's a mouth. So what are the processes in those holes to processes of protection? Let's go to the ears first. Well, we've got an eardrum. That prevents anything going in there. And if a little bug or something happens or little bits of dirt, we've got little hairs there and then there's the, the earwax that traps it. So there's a whole lot of processes there to protect the internal part of the body. And look at the eye. If, someone, if something comes along and hits, we've got a lovely ridge around our eye that protects but let's say it's smaller than that and it, it goes to go in the eye. Well, the blinking reflex happens. There's lashes there that can stop it. But let's say it still gets through. Well, when it gets through into the eye, then there's the a mucus around the eye. Then if it's a bug, it can't survive because it drowns. And I'm sure we all know if there's some little, something gets into your eye, you go around the world. Is that right? Make your eyes go around the world and it moves it to the corner and we can flick it out. So there's a whole lot of processes in the eye to protect the internal organism. What about the nose? Now you're probably aware that there are two tubes going down your throat. There's one from your mouth and that's the esophagus and there's one from your nose and that's the trachea and that goes down into your lungs and through the esophagus goes down into your stomach. And when we swallow it closes off the trachea and opens the esophagus. It's a fascinating process. But I think if we've been eating fast or drinking fast, sometimes when we start coughing, what do we know then? A little bit's gone down the wrong tube. <laughs> Don't we say that? Oh, it went down the wrong hole. And we cough and cough and cough. It's a wonderful process, coughing. It's a process to get waste out of the lungs. So let's start by looking at the nose. The nose does three things. The nose purifies the air, it warms the air, and it humidifies the air. Mouth does not do that. That's why we should be nose abdominal breathers. Why abdominal breathers? Because your abdomen, it, it massages to open up the whole lungs. A lot of people are high chest breathers because of poor posture, tight tight clothes, we should be able to put our fist into our skirt or our pants so that our abdominal muscles can, which have been designed to aid in the breathing process, so we get that full quota of air. So that's what nose does. And if someone says to me, but I can't breathe through my nose. Now you remember that three letter word? Why? Why can't you breathe through your nose? Well, it's because it's all stuffed up with mucus. Why? It should not be. If you've got a cold, I understand it. And aren't we glad that you can breathe through your mouth when you've got a cold? Well, usually, if someone has a lot of mucus in their nasal areas and maybe build up in sinus, it's, a, it's an allergy. Because if you're breathing in something that, that uh, has an aller allergy effect, like mold or chemicals, then the body can create a lot of mucus to trap it and, and protect. But also, if we're eating a food that the body has an allergy to, 
um, a lot of mucus can be created. So I'm going to give you the five allergens. So I'll write it up on the board. So your five allergens, these are the most common allergic foods, which is the most common reason why a person would have, you know, constantly a lot of mucus in that area. Peanuts. Peanuts commonly grow mould, and it's the mould that causes the allergen. If you can grow peanuts, harvest them, wash them, boil them, well, that's what they do down south, isn't it? Or dry roast them, you know, it would probably be all right. But the problem is, I know in Australia, 75% of Australians live in the city, so all the food's grown in the country. It's harvested, it's put in the silo, you get a cold frosty morning and a hot sunny day and it's very conducive to mould growth because the peanuts grow in the ground. Also, uh, dairy. Some people who grew up on dairy farms and their grandparents were dairy farmers and their great great grandparents etc etc those people can handle dairy usually because genetically it's in their genes and they're used to it, but it has to be the raw organic. In fact, the cow's milk in the supermarket, if you were to give that to a newborn baby cow, that cow would die because of the change they've done to the cow's milk. So that's a common allergen. Also, the hybridised wheat. We touched on that a little bit yesterday, and we're going to be looking at it again in the uh, acid alkaline presentation. But the, this hybridisation, putting the wheat through intensive crossbreeding, remember I said it was rushed through no safety studies, and it, it changed the starch structure, which we looked at yesterday, but it also changed the gluten or the protein structure. Very difficult to digest, so often gets an allergy response. Also, I found maybe in about 30% of people who come to our retreats, uh, oats have an allergy. Some people can handle oats, some people can't. But if someone is constantly blowing their nose and <laughs> making a lot of mucus, I would stop these five allergens. It can take a couple of months to see a full clearing. Now, refined sugar just compounds the whole problem. So if someone's an oat lover and they decide to stop all this to clear up their eustachian tubes, and after, say, three months, all is clear, they can, go, they can try the oats because that's probably the least allergen. So they're the five known allergens. They're, they're the, one of the main reasons why people have a lot of excess mucus there. And I've had people say to me, I can't believe I can breathe. <laughs> And my energy levels, a lot of people uh, suffer with these ailments not realising that, that there is no need. Because a lot of people say, yeah, but oats are good, yeah, but wheat, wheat wheat's great, peanuts, high in protein. But it's looking behind the scenes and looking at why they, they could be causing that allergen response. So that's one of the main reasons people have too much mucus in that area. The nasal passage is a very interesting uh, area inside the nose. It's got like little half caves all around it. So if we breathe in something that has a little bit of dust on it, then it's a little heavier. So it shoots, ricochets all around the little cave areas to drop off the foreign object, which means now the air is light and it can go down to our lungs. Mouth does not do that. That's why it's important to be a nose breather. Now, when it comes down into our trachea and into our lungs, there are little hairs there. So if a foreign object did escape through the nose, nasal passages, but if it goes in through the mouth, you're more likely to get a problem down there because you haven't got that, that cleansing action that the, the nasal passages have. Well, if it gets down into the lungs, there's little little hairs there, there's mucus there that can trap it, and often the person will cough. Coughing's a wonderful process. It brings, it brings that foreign object up. So we've looked at ears, and we've looked at eyes, and we've looked at the nasal passages. Now we're going to look at the mouth. And the mouth 
has a tube called the esophagus that goes down through a little valve just here. It's like a muscle called the cardiac sphincter that opens into the stomach, and that's where the food goes. Now, let's just say someone has a slice of bread. They get a sandwich at a sandwich bar. I think that's what you call it. And the person that is making the sandwich, they had just gone out the back and patted the dog. OK, so the, they've got something on their hands that happens to get into your sandwich, and you can't see it because they're microorganisms. And then you eat that sandwich, and a bit of bacteria had started to grow, and you don't even realize it. And you swallow it down into your stomach. Well, there's a wonderful front-line defense system there, which is your part, a strong part of your immune system. And you might be surprised to know that it's your hydrochloric acid. Hydrochloric acid is very strong. And hydrochloric acid, if you put one drop on your skin, it would burn your skin. But God designed the stomach with these big folds. And these folds are lined with glands. And two thirds of those glands are mucus. Mucus is 99% water. So that's a thick mucosa wall lining the stomach to protect it from the hydrochloric acid. And so these little, little glands in here, they're called the parietal glands. They release hydrochloric acid, that's its short name, and pepsinogen, pepsinogen. And hydrochloric acid and pepsinogen, when they unite, they release pepsin. And pepsin is the enzyme that breaks down protein. So that's what most people know hydrochloric acid for, yeah, is to help break your food down, especially your protein. But what a lot of people don't realize is that hydrochloric acid is antibacterial. So if that bit of bacteria is in your sandwich and, you, and it gets into your stomach, your hydrochloric acid's designed to kill it. It's also antifungal. I have never met anyone with too much, hydro, with too much hydrochloric acid, too much acid in their stomach. And if someone says to me, oh, I've got too much acid in my stomach, I said, well, that's fantastic. You'll break your food down really well. But by the way, how do you know you've got too much acid? Well, it hurts. Well, what, why does it hurt? Is it because the person's dehydrated and they don't have that thick mucosa wall? And then someone would say, well, it keeps coming up. Well, the problem's not the acid. It's supposed to be acid. The problem's the little gate there. There's a, it's a two-layered gate here to stop the acid coming up. Well, why would it come up? Well, it could come up because the person eats breakfast like a pauper, lunch like a pauper, and the supper at night's the king and the queen together, <laughs> late. <laughs> and then they lay down, and gravity pushes against that little valve, weakening it. And that little valve's a muscle. And when that muscle is relaxed, it's closed. And when it tightens, it opens. So stress. Let's say someone has a huge evening meal because they didn't have time to eat breakfast and they didn't have time to eat lunch. And, blah, blah, and then they're starving at night and they eat big. And then they decide to watch uh, a horror movie or something. And oh, someone's going to come out the door. Oh, whatever. Can you see the stress? And, and they're lying down and... Uh, uh, now, this isn't the odd time this might happen. This is day after day after day after night after night after night after night. And then the acid starts to come up. I met one lady, her whole esophagus was ulcerated. And that's just not one time that the acid's coming up. That's happening again and again. And so she goes to the doctor, what does he give her? Ant acids. Now that don't make any sense at all to me. Because I think, what's going to break the protein down now? But I do understand that this lady needs help. She doesn't want more acid coming up. So what do we say? Eat breakfast like a king, lunch like a queen, and supper like a pauper. One lady said, what do paupers eat? I said, sometimes nothing. 
So when you go to sleep, the stomach's empty. And you know the stomach loves that because when you go to sleep, guess who else wants to sleep? Stomach. And take magnesium before you go to bed because magnesium is a rel muscle relaxant. And if you take magnesium, that muscle, that cardial, cardiac sphincter will relax and close. How simple is that? Did you know that dogs have 10 times the hydrochloric acid that humans have? And they don't get reflux? And they don't get heartburn? And they don't get stomach ulcers? I was at my daughter's place recently and she's got this big dog. And the neighbour across the road had shot an animal for some reason. So I guess what the dog did? Dragged parts of this dead thing onto the lawn and eating it. No wonder it's got 10 times the hydrochloric acid. <laughs> because that hydrochloric acid is so strong, it, it, it'll, it'll wipe that, that poison out. So there's, and you probably never thought that I'd be talking about your hydrochloric acid when I talked about your immune system, yeah. But can you see how it's one of your front lines, is your hydrochloric acid. So what can you do if your hydrochloric acid is low? And by the way, how would you know it was low? You would know it was low because it's five hours since you ate and you feel like you've just eaten. If your hydrochloric acid was very, very strong, you'd probably be hungry about every three hours because it would break down your food very, very quickly. Can you see that? So how can you boost it? Well, we need something to wake up that hydrochloric acid. We need something to wake up these glands. Eat breakfast like a king, lunch like a queen, and supper like a pauper. Only drink between meals, not with meals. If you drink with your meals, you're going to water down what? Your hydrochloric acid. Juice of a lemon will boost it just before you eat. A quarter of a teaspoon of cayenne pepper in a little water. That'll wake anything up. <laughs> and if you've got a stomach ulcer, yes, it'll even heal that. That's, that's cane pepper. So there's some of the things you can do to boost that hydrochloric acid. But let's say someone's got low hydrochloric acid and that bit of bacteria that was on that sandwich, uh, it gets through the stomach and it's still alive. Well, God's got another line of defense and this might surprise you too. Lining your small intestine are villi. And these villi have a thick turf wall around them. And that thick turf wall is made up of Lactobacillus acidophilus bifidus bacterium, called the healthy or the friendly bacteria. In fact, they call it today our microbiome. You've heard of that? And it, it, it does four main things. So it is responsible for the final breakdown of the food. Your hydrochloric acid and your pepsin certainly helps with some of the breakdown. There are other enzymes coming out of your liver, coming out of your pancreas that also are helping with the breakdown of your food. It does the final touch. And it also is responsible, this, these bacterias, for the absorption of our nutrients out of the gut and through to the blood because there's blood capillaries through here. But the one we're particularly interested in, so I'm going to write it in bigger letters, this healthy or friendly bacteria plays a very important role in protecting our internal environment. Your gastrointestinal tract is a hollow tube. And later on the, in the week, I'm going to take you on a journey all through your gastrointestinal tract. We're going to start with the mouth and we're going to end up at the other end. It's a fascinating journey. And we'll be talking about this again, but I particularly want to target this tonight. Its fourth role is that it helps to nourish the cells that line the gut. But it plays a protective role. So can you see if hydrochloric acid failed you? You've got another line down here, and that's your Lactobacillus acidophilus bifidus bacterium. In fact, there are probably millions of different types of little creepy crawlies in our gut. 
But they, the two permanent are your Lactobacillus acidophilus and your Bifidus bacterium. When we were in our mother's womb, our gut was sterile. When we were born, we were literally showered with our mother's microorganisms. And then the thick turf wall is set up. <clears throat> we'll be exploring that in a bit more detail when we go on the journey through the gastrointestinal tract. But today, we're looking at our immune system, and so that's another line of protection. Remember, we looked at the, the skin, the ears, the eyes, the nose, all systems to protect our internal environment. And so this too protects it. So what would break that down? Antibiotics do quite a good job. I'm not against antibiotics, they can save lives, and that's what they should be kept for, saving lives. In fact, most people should go through their lives not ever having it. But the body can cope with a couple of courses in a lifetime. <clears throat> Did you hear that? A couple of courses in a lifetime. In our second uh, presentation tonight, we're going to be looking at natural remedies and I'm going to be showing you some very powerful natural antibiotics that do not kill off your, your good bacteria. One writer said taking an antibiotic is like dropping a, an atomic bomb in the gut. What did the atomic bomb do? It killed the good and the bad alike. That's what antibiotics do. One lady told me that her little daughter had 22 courses in the first year of life. Ooh. Ooh, that hurt. Eh. The girl was 15 now. Was she well? Not at all. Not at all. You'll find in most, most, uh, most countries that they traditionally always had some form of cultured food. So in Europe, it was sauerkraut. In Japan, it was miso, tofu. In Asia, it's kamchu and miso. So you'll find in, in just about every country, traditionally, they always had a cultured food. And those cultured foods, and your yogurts, your kefirs too, they, uh, they help to maintain your healthy bacteria. What also can kill the, the bacteria is long-term painkiller use. Also, statin drugs are able to knock that off. Refined sugar. This one here, it, it also can knock it off. So what happens then? You've got parts of your, uh, your protection has gone. So let's say that bacteria that came in on the sandwich because the lady had patted the dog before she made your sandwich. Let's say it, it got through hydrochloric acid, it got through the front line, you know, the front line of soldiers. And then, oh no, we've got a gap in here, and in it goes, and now it's in the blood. But there's another line of defense in the blood, and that's our white blood cells. So let's have a look at our white blood cells. So our white blood cells are our internal army. And I don't want to lose you here, but remember I'm speaking about you. So we have five different types of white blood cells. One is the neutrophils. And the neutrophils, they're the white blood cells that take up about 65% of the white blood cells. Then we've got monocytes. And we've got lymphocytes. These are the white blood cells that are made in the lymph, the lymph nodes. And we've also got uh, basophils, just in case you think I'm talking in another language, this is English, eosinophils. So God has given us quite an extensive immune system, isn't that right? So let's have a look at what these do. These take up 3%. These take up um, 2%. So then we've got 20% here. I think that's 10. Is my maths right? Six, seven, eight. Yeah. My husband would be proud of me. 
He's my mathematician. At Misty Mountain Health Retreat, when guests first used to come in, I used to do a live blood analysis. You take a drop of blood and you put it under the microscope. And you see lots of little red blood cells. And we do a dark field condenser which lights up the white blood cells. So here's the neutrophils. They're about that big and they've got a few little centers in them. That's your neutrophil. So your monocytes, as the name implies, they're a white blood cell that just has, has one, one center. And then the lymphocytes, they're like a hazy, very hazy. They've got a little hazy section around there and a little dot there. And your basophils, oh, I don't have a bright yellow here, but I'm going to do them red. They light up. They're, they're, they light up, and the eosinophils, they also light up. So they, they're, they're very bright. Now, the eosinophils have lots of little moving things around in them. These has a couple of centers. And they are histamine granules. So when I look at a blood slide, we move around and we look at about how many of the white blood cells they have. And if a person has a cold, we'll see a lot of white blood cells. Which means when a person gets a cold, what's their immune system like? Huh? So your, your immune system is high because it's busy, it's busy. And remember, the cold is a house clean, so if there's a little bit of debris in the lungs, the white blood cells are going to go there and they're going to help to clean that up and then you'll cough up yellow lumps, is that right? Do you know what those yellow lumps are? Are dead white blood cells doing their job? My sister is a senior science teacher and whenever she teaches the immune system, she stops, she looks at her students and says, see, the body's been designed to heal itself. In fact, it's an amazing immune system. And right at this moment, in 2021 and 2020, medical profession, Nurses, doctors, naturopaths, they agreed on one thing. You know that was? The best thing we can do is boost our immune system. Is that right? Because it can do it. It's actually designed to do it. It's the most powerful thing on the planet to fight disease, is the immune system. So these lymphocytes are the scouts. So they're looking around if there's any bacteria or anything, pathogen, that needs to be dealt with, and they'll, they'll give a message to the neutrophils, and the neutrophils come, and, and they have um, hydrogen peroxide in them. Did you know that? And they spurt it out, cover it, kill them, and then they die in the process. That's why, that, that's what creates pus, basically, is the neutrophils have just died in the process of killing off the, the bacteria. But sometimes when I look at a blood slide, I would see only two neutrophils in, sorry, eosinophils in the whole blood slide. That's normal. Sometimes I would see six to eight. Sometimes I would see 15. Sometimes I have even seen about 21. Why would that be? It's because the person has an allergy to something they're eating. So if the person has, because remember these are the histamines, and if someone has an allergy response, what are you given? Antihistamines. So when there's an allergy response, there's a rise in the eosinophils. So if someone has five to six uh, eosinophils in the slide, then I know that they have a sensitivity to dairy and wheat. That's the most common. If they have 10, 12 eosinophils, I know they have an intolerance. And if they have 21 
eosinophils, I know that they are celiac. <laughs> and I start to ask them, and as soon as I ask them, their response tells me that the blood side has, conf has confirmed it. Because if a person has an allergy to these foods, then the white blood cells come along to, to try and deal with them so that the person stays alive. What an incredible body that we have got. So I'm going to tell you a story about a little boy that I saw in New Zealand. And this little boy, uh, he came with his mother, who came to see me over something, and he had a finger twice the size that it usually is. So I said to the mother, what happened to the finger? She said, oh, it's cellulitis. Well, that's not rocket science, is it? Yeah, it's inflamed. You know what cellulitis is? Inflammation of the cell. Well, we knew there was inflammation. I said, I said, yeah, but something must have caused it. So you always put your detective hat on. She said, oh, he had a blister there. And the blister broke while he was playing with his matchbox cars in the dirt. So see, the skin's just rubbed off. So what's happening now? The dirt's got in. So little boy, he didn't know. He just kept playing with his cars. So by the time he went inside and the mother saw it and she washed it, we already had an incredible response there. So what you've, you've not only got the blood send, sending the white blood cells, you've got something else, and it's your body's vacuum cleaner. Did you know that you have an internal vacuum cleaner? It's called the lymphatic system. And the lymphatic system sweeps away waste from the tissues. And that lymphatic system, that's a clear fluid, that was causing it to swell. And one of the reasons the swelling happens is it's almost a defense system to block off the, the run of the blood to go in there so it doesn't go to the whole body. But whenever you've got swelling, that causes pain. I said, aha, uh -huh. um, what have you been doing for it? She said, well, I took him to the doctor and he's on his second course of antibiotics. So we're going into halfway through the second week now. I, I don't know what it looked like before that. It couldn't have looked much worse. In fact, I think if it got any bigger, it looked like it was going to explode. I said, ah, oh, anything else? Oh, he's on painkillers. He's seven. And he's on sleeping tablets to help him sleep at night. I said, can I <clears throat> try something? She said, certainly. So this is what I did. It's an incredibly simple procedure. And 60 years ago, nurses were taught this. In fact, I have the nurse's textbook. It's Nipe's Book of Hydrotherapy for Nurses. It's water therapy. So I got two cups. In one of them, I put hot, just hot water. And in the second one, I put cold, but it was ice cold. So it was cold with some ice, cold, ice cubes in it. And I got the little boy to put his good finger in the hot and get a temperature he was happy with. Then I got him to put his sore finger in, oh! <laughs> so you make it a little bit cooler. You've got to work with your person. And when he could just bear that, and it was really warm, the first one. Now, with hot water, the first effect is stimulation. And it takes three minutes to get from stimulation to a slowing down. It can be like when we get into a hot bath and we're a little bit cool. It's tingly, isn't it? We feel a tingling. That's a stimulation. But it's not long after you're in that hot bath, some people even fall asleep. Is that right? There's a slowing down. So before it's got time to slow down, we're going to put his finger in the ice cold. And the first reaction is stimulation. But the difference is that this stimulation is a reaction because we're warm-blooded creatures and we don't like cold, do we? So when you put that finger into cold water, there's a reaction. 
It's almost as if it goes, oh no, cold, move. And it takes 30 seconds before there's a slowing down. So then we put it back into the hot. But before we put it back into the hot, I put a little boiling water in there. He's watching me. You've got to work with the will of a person. I said, put your good finger in. You happy with that? Yes. I said, you, you will be able to bear it now because your fingers had the cold. So it went back into the cold, into the hot, sorry. And he could bear that three minutes. Before it's got time to slow down, what do we do? Back into the cold. And we did this three times. What are we doing? What's being stimulated? Blood. What's the blood got in it? White blood cells, yes. But you know what else it's got in it? It's got red blood cells. And the red blood cells have oxygen, they have nutrition, they have water, and they carry away waste. So whenever you've got an injury, the blood tends to sit or pool there. Remember when that lymphatic system came, it blocked the area? So we want to get fresh blood in, which drives the old blood out. So by the end of his second hot water going into the ice cold, a smile came to the little boy's face. What does that mean? He's getting relief. In fact, by the end of this whole process, how how long does that take? Not long, 11, 12 minutes. By the time, and I could just read from his body language, just his shoulders relaxed, his whole body relaxed, he smiled. I would like to assess that he got about 60% pain relief. How long does it take for, uh, you call it Tylenol, is that right? We have Panadol or we have Nurofen, you know, over-the-counter pain relief. How long do they take to have an effect? Half hour? Hmm? This is within 11 minutes, he's got 60% pain relief. You, you, you could not take the smile off his face. Ah. You know, I was reading a book, I'm reading a book at the moment called The Gift of Pain, an incredible book. And he, right at the end, he talks about pleasure and pain. And he said, do you know what the most pleasure comes after? Pain. <laughs> this little boy was experiencing pure pleasure. <laughs> pain relief. Hmm? Uh, a glass of water is never so good as when you get to the top of a mountain. Is that right? <laughs> you worked hard to get up there. How simple is that? And then I grated a potato, just a little bit, probably only about a teaspoon, I grated a potato. And what I did was I wrapped it in a cloth about this big. And the potato took up about that much, just a little, maybe a teaspoon of grated potato. Then I folded this one over, this one over, this one over, this one over. So now I've got a little package and it's about that big. And where I've only got one layer, I put that on the wound and then I put a little bit of plastic over it and then I taped it on and then I asked the little boy if we could pray that God would bless the poultice. Uh, That little boy was willing to do anything for me. When they got home that afternoon, it was probably about two o'clock by the time they got home, the little boy said to his mother, can we do that again? Now why did he say that? He got relief. And then, so they did it at two and they did it again. I think they took it off maybe six o'clock at night. Little boy had a shower and they did it again then. Every time they took it off, the finger's going down a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. And then the next morning when they took it off, and by the way, that little boy didn't need painkillers or sleeping tablets that night. And in the morning when they took it off, all the waste came out. Every, everything just came out. Wow. No need for painkillers, no need for antibiotics, no need for sleeping tablets. She said, what will I do with the medication? I said, I have no authority over your medication, but I'll leave it up to you. I can tell you what I'd do if, if you'd like to know, but I think you know. So after a week and a half, th- this was still... Yeah. And yet we got results within 
Well, we got results within 11 minutes, that little boy got relief. How simple is that? Not only that, your white blood cells and your red blood cells are, are made in your bone marrow. Did you know that? And when you do that hot and cold to any area of the body, it stimulates the bone marrow to make more red and white blood cells, which is also you've got working for you. So I want to tell you, I'll write down exactly what is in the blood because the blood is the healer. So in the blood, we've got white blood cells and we just had a look at those. They're your internal army. And you've got red blood cells. For healing to happen in the body, it needs oxygen. For healing to happen in the body, it needs the blood to be nice and thin, which is what water does to it. We saw that yesterday. And it needs nutrients to be able to heal. And the red blood cells also carry away the waste. In fact, I'd like to suggest this is a perfect system for healing. A perfect system. All we need into any injury is more blood. Isn't that right? And the, and the best way to move blood is water. <laughs> the hot and the, the alternating hot and cold waters, that is the most powerful way to do it. I had a man visit me once and he was limping. He, he was a friend of a friend who was visiting and he was limping. So I'm, my eyes immediately go to the foot. Whoa, his toe was twice the size. I said, oh, what's happening with that toe? He said, ingrown toenail. Well, a couple of the people wanted to get scissors. The guy's looking terrified. I said, back off. <laughs> so I got two buckets, hot water, cold water. It did exactly the same thing, put a grated potato on it. What the potato does is it's very cooling and it gets the inflammation down. So your grated potato poultices, excellent for swollen ankles, um, ingrown toenails, splinters. I crashed on the bridge a little while ago and a splinter went up my finger. My son tried to get it out, but I couldn't bear the pain. I said, leave it, I'll, I'll get it out. <laughs> and I put grated potato on it. Now after three days, I looked at it, pushed it, and the splinter just popped out. This is on a bridge that's about 60 years old, so imagine how dirty all that is. The hot and coals and the poultices just keep it nice and clean. So what's the best way to boost your immune system? Make sure you're getting pure air. Make sure you're drinking adequate water. Make sure you're on a plant-based diet that's not refined, food in its natural state. But there's a special thing that you can do to give it an added boost, and that is finish every hot shower with cold. Now this is a good time to start before you go into the winter. So the good news is you can have 10 minutes hot shower and if you're not used to cold, you can start with 10 seconds. You can build up to 20 and then to 30 and you'll go like this, <gasps> but don't worry about that. <laughs> We're warm blooded creatures and we don't like the cold, do we? So now's a good time to start. It is the best defense that you can take into the winter months against winter colds and flus. It's just that very simple um, finishing with hot water. Notice I didn't say 10 seconds hot and 10 minutes cold. You can if you like. But 10 minutes hot and just that quick cold. If you finish with a quick cold, um, you will not chill, even on cool air. Because what cold does is it equalizes the circulation and it prevents chilling. So our guests that come to the retreats, they have a steam sauna every afternoon. We have a little hut, we have a fire that, we've got this thing that heats up the, the water and there are pipes that go under the seat with steam and our guests are in there for 
10, 15 minutes, as long as they can bear it. We have some cold water in there because there's only one part of the body that doesn't like getting cold and that's the brain. So just keep the head cool. Do you know what we're creating? A fever. Hmm? Who designed fevers? God designed fevers and he designed fevers for a purpose. And then after 10 minutes in the steam, they go out and they dive in the mountain streams. Very nice. It's so nice when you are so hot. You're so hot that it's just a lovely relief. And then back into the, co to the hot stoner, and we usually do that three times. If I do a live blood analysis on someone and their white blood cell count is quite low, by the time they leave, it's up <laughs> because of those, hot, those alternating hot and colds. So let me tell you about a fever, because a fever is very misunderstood. So three things to remember with a fever. Number one, fever is your friend. Why is it your friend? Because when the body's temperature goes up, Let's say the body's temperature goes up to, well, I know, Celsius, would that be 40? That would be 98 or something for Fahrenheit. Would you consider that a fever? What would be a fever temperature? 100? 100, yeah, I think 100 is about 42, I think, Celsius. Yeah, that's a fever. And there's only one part of the body that doesn't like getting hot, and that's the brain. And the only time a person may convulse is if they're dehydrated. So the second thing to remember is, is water puts the fire out. Water inside and water outside. But what if someone can't drink? Give them ice cubes to suck on. But you've got to somehow get that water in. And if they're vomiting and can't even suck on that, there's another way to put water in, and that's an enema. And you can put two cups of water in that way, like that. That's quicker than any drip. And I've seen people that have been very dehydrated. You do a two-cup enema, nothing comes out because the body goes... Whoosh. It's the quickest way to do it. And you can put water on the outside. So there are a few things you can do, not to stop the fever, but just get it down. Like if someone's 100, you want to bring them down to about a 96, yeah? So they're, they're a bit more comfortable. So you can lay them in not a hot bath and not a cold bath, tepid bath, lukewarm. And if someone's got a high temp and you put them in a tepid bath, that water gets hotter because that water is pulling the heat out. And keep the cool on the head. Or you can give them a hot foot bath. You find when someone's got a fever, often their feet are cold. So you put their feet in hot water and it pulls the heat down into the water and put cold, cool on their head. Sometimes that'll take the edge off. Or if you can't do either of those, don't have a bath, don't have any buckets, you can lay the person down on a towel, have as little clothes on as possible, cover them with a towel, take one arm out and have a bowl of warm water and a face cloth and just sponge this area. Not totally wrung out, so you're leaving a bit of water on there and the water will pull the heat out, then dry it. And you'll find just that will take that temperature down a bit. Then do the other arm then dry it, then do the torso, then dry that, then do one leg and then the other leg and then turn them over. You can do this often on a little child who might not like the more drastic measures. And then uh, by the time you've done that, often the temperature comes down a little bit. And if it comes up again in two hours, just do it again. Because remember, when all the rubbish is burnt up, the fire will go out. When rubbish gone, or I'll be American here and say trash, is that right? <laughs> when trash gone, then the fire will go out. Fire goes. 
So that's what you've got to remember. The, the fever is a wonderful thing. It has a purpose. And when the fever's up at 100, healing, healing can accelerate almost 400 times. Blood circulation accelerates. So it's a wonderful process. And all through, all through Europe, in sanitariums, uh, wellness centers, fevers have been used for centuries to boost the healing response in the body. It's also uh, fever baths are often given to cancer patients to boost the healing in the body. So fever is nothing to fear. I've had a few mothers ring me or email me, my baby has a fever. I said, don't worry about it, it's your friend. Just keep the baby cool by giving the baby bits of water, putting it in a, in a uh, tepid bath. My daughter said her little baby had a fever and she didn't want to go in the bath, she wanted to be held by mother. So then Emma did probably the most powerful way to get the fever down. She got a woolen blanket, she got a sheet, little sheet, baby sized sheet. She wet it, wrung it out, and laid the wet sheet on the woolen blanket, wrapped the baby up quickly in the wet sheet, the baby did not like that, and then quickly wrapped the baby in the woolen blanket. As Soon as the woolen blanket's on, then it doesn't feel so bad, and then baby was happy because mother was able to hold baby. And what happens is that wet sheet pulls the heat out of the body, and that wet sheet goes from cold to hot. Where'd the hot come from? in the body, and you'll find the temperature will come down. To do it on an adult, you get a bed, you put a, say, a shower curtain over the bed, then you put a woolen blanket, it has to be wool. Wool is the only, only fabric that you can use, must be wool. Put a woolen blanket over, wring out the sheet and put that over the woolen blanket. And then the person ideally just has, say, a pair of underpants on, lay them on the wet sheet with their arms up, and the first side of the sheet goes around their torso, under their arm, and between their legs, arms down, and then the sheet goes right around them. It doesn't feel very nice when a person's hot and you're putting a wet sheet on them. And then quickly put the blanket around them. As Soon as the blanket goes around them, then this, the discomfort goes, and the sheet starts to warm up. And as the sheet warms up, the temperature in the body goes down. It's a very old hydrotherapy treatment is the wet sheet pack. And often you'll find the person with the fever will fall asleep in the wet sheet pack. You can get them out after 10 minutes and if the fever goes up again, put them back in a wet sheet pack. But I've had a few parents get scared because their baby had a fever and give them a drug to get the temperature down. But guess what happens after the drug wears off? <sighs> fever goes up sometimes even higher. You, you, you got to let the fever run its course. So this father, he said, I'm just beside myself. I'm not sleeping. My baby's four months old. The baby got high fevers after the vaccine. So the baby's reacted to the poisons in the vaccine. So he said, every time we give a drug, goes worse. I said, my babies all had fever at some time, sometimes when they got a cold, sometimes when they're teething, they'll get a fever. But I never, ever gave them a drug. I said, I'd make sure they're well hydrated. If they're breastfed, they want to feed a lot, and that's good, they're getting the fluid. And I, if they were not uncomfortable, I would just let them sleep. But if they start to get uncomfortable, meaning the temperature's going too high, then I would either give them a wet sheet pack or I'd sponge them down or put them in a tepid bath. And you just keep bringing it down to that level, but it eventually goes. So I find with a lot of parents like that, I'm emailing them every day, it's all right, this will pass, it has a purpose. But they get back to me and say, thank you. <gasps> That, that helped, that helped. And so this father that had been dealing with this fever, drug, temperature goes down, comes back even higher. When he stopped doing that and started to keep the baby a bit cool when the baby got too hot and well hydrated, the next day the fever was gone because he let it run its course. But that fever has a purpose and it's one of the most powerful immune system boosters is the fever. So next time you get a cold, or a cough, or a flu, 
and you get a fever, praise God. <laughs> because God designed it to help the body to heal. We're going to have a break now. We'll have about a 20 minute break. It is five past six, and I'm sure you know there's a water fountain out there. And when we come back, we're going to have a look at what you can do, some simple natural remedies that you can do if you get a cold or a flu or COVID. So please have a break. Welcome back, everyone. Well, welcome back while we... We're going to be looking at some natural treatments that you can do if you have a cold or bronchitis or the flu or that strain of flu called COVID. So... What can we do if we get a cold? What did our grandmother do when she got a cold? Lemon and honey drink, is that right? She'd take a lemon and honey drink, she'd take a garlic, she might just have soup, she might have a hot foot bath and put some mustard in the hot foot bath, yeah? Our feet are a reflex for abdomen, for chest and for head. So if you've got a headache or if you've got congestion in that area and put your feet in hot water, the reason why the hot water release or relieves it is because whenever you've got a problem in those areas, you've, you've usually got a congestion of blood. And you put your feet in hot water and blood will be pulled down to that hot water and the blood will be pulled away from any area that is congested. So that's basically how it works. So if anyone comes to Misty Mountain and has a headache, it's usually from stopping the caffeine, we give them a hot foot bath and it just takes the edge off for them. So congested head, hot foot bath. Congested chest, hot foot bath. Uh, any problem in the abdominal area, uh, hot foot bath. If anyone's stressed out, give them a hot foot bath. So. And as we just looked at, it can also uh, take the edge off a of fever. But I'm going to give you the recipe for something called the flu bomb. In fact, nowadays, we could just about call it the COVID bomb, couldn't we? So whenever I talk about a flu, I'm also referring to COVID. But please remember that the figures tell us that 98.8% of people that get COVID recover. So it really is nothing to fear. And the figures show that only 2% of people that get COVID get it serious. Now that's what the figures say, serious. That's not even deadly. And if you have a look at deaths worldwide, 2021, 20, 2020, there are no more deaths than they were worldwide in 2015. So if someone says to me, how can I protect myself from the COVID I say, stop watching the news. <laughs> when I look at what they wrote about me, I'm sorry, but I can't believe a thing they say anymore. <laughs> because it's, it's not true. <laughs> That's why we're the doctors and we have to really work it out for ourselves. So let's have a look at the flu bomb or the COVID bomb. So the flu bomb has six main ingredients. Number one ingredient is garlic. Did you know that there was a research paper that I read that said that garlic was six times more powerful than tetracycline? And tetracycline is a fairly strong antibiotic. So there's your antibiotic. And as you probably know, an antibiotic doesn't do anything to a virus. But Garlic will. Garlic's antimicrobial, antibiotic, antifungal, antiviral. So how much garlic, how much can you handle? So if I was giving the flu bomb to a five-year-old, I might do a tiny little clove of garlic. If I was having the flu bomb, I might have a very large 
garlic. So with the garlic, you can crush it or you can finely grate it. So we'll just say crushed. The second ingredient is ginger. Now there is an amount with ginger, it's about a quarter of a teaspoon. And that is usually finely grated. The ginger is well known for its anti-nausea and anti-inflammatory properties. It's also a heating herb. The next ingredient, this is one drop of eucalyptus oil. And as one lady said to me, I've got a bottle of eucalyptus oil and it says that you must not take it by mouth. Well, I'm not suggesting you drink half a cup. Remember common sense. Now, when I was 25, I met an 80-year-old lady who shared a lot of natural remedies with me. She's passed now. And in fact, if she was still alive, she'd be well into her hundreds by now. And she told me that when she was a little girl, she was one of about eight children. If one of the children got a cold or a sniffle, they all had to line up to get half a teaspoon of honey with one drop of eucalyptus oil in it. And so all the children were given the spoon. And she said, you know, it was amazing. The rest of us didn't get the cold. Oh, I don't know who put that there. Sorry. <laughs> so one drop of eucalyptus oil. If you don't have eucalyptus oil, you could use tea tree oil. One lady asked if you could use oregano oil. Oregano essential oil is even stronger than eucalyptus. So... Yeah, just, just one drop, <laughs> just one drop. The next one is cayenne pepper. Now, I haven't got an amount here because some people can only handle a sprinkle, some people can handle a quarter of a teaspoon, some people can handle half a teaspoon. So it's whatever you can handle. The next ingredient is lemon. If lemons are a dollar a lemon, I might do a squeeze. If they're falling off my tree, I might do a whole lemon. So lemon. If you haven't got lemon, you could use lime. And honey. And it's usually one teaspoon of honey. You could put four teaspoons of honey in there, but it would make no difference. It still wouldn't taste any better. <laughs> Nothing hides this stuff. <laughs> but one teaspoon of honey. And then about a half a cup of, of hot water. And then you drink it. And you don't have to chew up these things, you just throw it down. So if the first sign of a sniffle or a cold coming on, take a flu bomb and take it three times a day. My, my daughter, Emma, she lives in Wisconsin, and her 22-year-old son, my grandson, who's getting married next Sunday, he's a paramedic, and he got the COVID flu. He came home and gave it to his mother and father and all his siblings. <laughs> so the whole house had COVID. Oh, now it's about five years ago, my daughter went into a little bit of debt and, and paid for a little steam sauna hut to be built beside her house. And it's a little steam sauna hut and there's a little change room. And so she, and it's got a little wood box, so she, she, lit, she lit up the, the sauna box, sauna, and they had that twice a day, in the morning and in the afternoon. Now she's got, I think it's like a horse trough, a huge big tub, twice as wide as that and about that deep, and she fills up with cold water. So they sit in the hot sauna for 10, 15 minutes. Because it's not steam, it just is a sauna with rocks, they have a bucket of water and they keep just putting a little bit of water on that to create the steam. And she also puts some essential oils on that, so that's very nice. So they did that for three times, hot, cold, yes, even the two-year-old. 
hot and coals. And um, they did that twice a day. She said they had about two flu bombs a day and they just had either juices or uh, soups, hot soups. She said by the fourth day they were all well. That's quick, isn't it? And her husband's a very large American man and he's on medication for diabetes and, um, and high blood pressure. So he was a candidate for getting seriously ill. You have probably read too that the people that get seriously ill have pre-existing health problems. As my husband says, no one dies of the flu anymore. No one dies of lung cancer anymore. It's all put under the label of COVID. In September, so this is exactly a year ago, my daughter, who lives near a lot of Amish people, she said one of her Amish friends, her 12-year-old son, he fell into a flooded creek and his clothes got caught on a log and he drowned. Very sad. So the ambulance came and, and took him away and they put on the death certificate that he died from COVID. Now the parents were very upset, as you can imagine. But this one case gives an indication of maybe the figures that are coming out aren't actually accurate. <laughs> so that is something also to be mindful of. COVID is real, it is there, but I don't believe it is something that we need fear. When you consider that 90, well, you can just about say 99% of people that get COVID recovered. More people die from smoking-related diseases, from alcohol-related diseases every year, and yet alcohol and smoking are not banned. So please consider these things when you consider COVID at the moment. I am so glad to be in Idaho. I just went into a shop this afternoon. Oh, and I didn't have to wear a mask. <laughs> I said to my husband, I'm in Idaho, there's no lockdowns, there's no masks. He, he said, can we move there? <laughs> I hear there are a lot of people trying to move here, so I hear that land prices have, have risen up, and I think a similar thing is happening in Florida. Do you know what's interesting? In Texas, in Florida, in Idaho, where there's not lockdowns or masks, there's no more cases than in the countries that are putting all this into place. I'm just so glad my husband sent to me a, a, a newspaper report yesterday that England has disbanded or decided not to have the green passport. What a blessing. My husband said that some of the backbenchers rose up and protested. So that is a relief because it really defies reason. When you consider that everyone, if everyone handled it this way, they would recover quickly. Now, most people that get a cold or a flu, they don't go rushing to hospital, do they? They usually just handle it at home. But they are rushing to hospital now, is that right? So you see, they're seeing more cases only because people are afraid. And God said in 2 Timothy 1 verse 7, he said, I've not given you the spirit of fear, but of power of love and of a sound mind. And that's what I wanted to do in this evening's presentations by beginning with the immune system and hopefully I've convinced you that you have a powerful immune system, that you have an inbuilt ability to heal itself and the body will heal itself. Here's the little two-letter word. If you give it the right conditions. And so when the body gets a cold, do you remember what it is? It's a house clean. So the COVID is a house clean. It's a house clean. So we just need, what do you do when you clean your house? You lose a, use a lot of water, is that right? So it's important to drink a lot of water. And I watched one presentation of a doctor who said that his patients who were quite sick with COVID, he found that they were all vitamin D deficient. So it's time to get out in that sunshine the ultraviolet rays from the sun, they hit the skin and they convert as form of cholesterol. Did you hear that? Yesterday we learned that cholesterol is not bad, didn't we? You need cholesterol. Are people vitamin D deficient because they're on cholesterol-lowering medication? When there's absolutely no need to be on cholesterol-lowering medication? 
So the ultraviolet rays from the sun, specifically the UVB rays, which by the way, sunscreen blocks. So if you go outside with sunscreen on, you won't get any vitamin D, even though you're way out in the sun. So last week when I was in Mexico, I had to stay there for two weeks. It's the only way that I was able to come into the US. And so what I did every day is I went and laid in the sun and I didn't take sunscreen, I took my watch. 15 minutes front, 15 minutes back, into the pool and back under the umbrella. And I have, I think you can see it a little bit, I have quite a nice tan. And that's a UVB tan. And the UVB tan, it will, it will last a long time. And it is UVB rays that, can, can, that convert the cholesterol into vitamin D. So there are a few requirements to get your vitamin D. One is that you get out there. And if you've got, I heard someone call it recently, milky skin like me. Well, I'm hoping I'm a little bit more olive now. You've got to be a little bit more careful. If I laid out in that sun for an hour, I would be bright red and burnt. I have now damaged my skin and I cannot go out into the sun. And a few days later, what's going to happen? It's going to all peel off. Does this sound like common sense again? That's not very common today. So when you go out into the sun, please take your watch. Please don't fall asleep. <laughs> and time yourself. And now that my skin is quite olive, I could probably go out there for an hour and not be burnt because my, sun is quite, my skin is quite olive now. And I haven't had a blood test for I don't know how many years, many, many, many years, but I endeavor to say that my vitamin D levels will be quite good. If you wash your body with soap and then go and lay in the sun, you won't get any vitamin D because you need to allow the oils to develop on your skin and that'll take a couple of hours. And then if you lay out in the sun, if I laid out in the sun and got very hot, so I just dived in the pool. And when I went back to my room, I just had a shower, no soap. Because if you lie out in the sun and then go and have a shower with soap and wash away the oils, you haven't given time for the vitamin D to develop. The vitamin D takes about two hours to develop. So there's some things to remember. And put as much of the body into the sun as, as you can. If you've got parts of the body that have not seen sun for a while, just go lightly. And if you do have a cold, isn't it nice to lie in the sun? Now, the COVID has been compared with the Spanish flu, but there is actually hardly any likeness because 50 million people died with the Spanish flu. But you might have seen some photos on Facebook. So I don't do Facebook, but my daughter showed me that uh, some nurses discovered if they put the people that had the flu out in the sunshine, they began to recover a lot quicker. So they were getting sunshine, they were getting fresh air, Sounds like the laws of health. First law of health is pure air. Second law of health is the sunshine. So we need the sunshine to get our vitamin D. And there are 2,500 receptor sites on the DNA for vitamin D. You cannot, your body cannot function properly without it and your body cannot heal without it. And so it's important to have the sunshine and have vitamin D. It's also important if you have a cold, if you, if you want to prevent from getting it, and if you get it and you want to handle it so that you recover quickly, so that remember you'll be stronger afterwards, is stop anything coming into the body that will harm it. So what would harm the body? Uh, refined sugar, your dairy products, uh, the hybridized wheat. I sometimes eat that wheat, but not much. But if I had any illness, I wouldn't touch it. Also, it's important to stop the dairy, it's important to stop meat, it's important to stop caffeine, to stop the um, alcohols, the cigarettes, the drugs. So it's important to stop anything that would inf interfere with the healing process. Refined sugar is well known to wipe out the white blood cells in quite large amounts. Chemotherapy is a big white blood cell killer. It, it kills. In fact, I've had someone come to our program that had not long gone through chemo. We couldn't find any white blood cells in her blood. Whoa. So that person is right in a condition where just about anything could take them down. 
By the end of the week, they were looking good after her hot and colds every night. Remember, the body can heal itself. Many people don't realise the conditions that the body needs to be able to heal. So what we also need to do is make sure we're getting adequate sleep. Now, if you can't sleep, I know one thing that will keep people awake is the chat room. Have you heard of the chat room? You wake in the middle of the night and my chat room starts this. Right, now tomorrow I'm going to do this and we're going to go over here and we're going to chat, 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 chat. Is that right? And I really should have done this and I wonder if that... Chat, 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 chat. You've got to get out of the chat room. So how can you get out of the chat room? Well, you can count from 50 back to 1 backwards or you can count sheep jumping over a fence or you can listen to some soft music or you can put a soft line on soft light on and get the most boring book you know you've just got to get your mind out of the chat room what i do is i love memorizing and i've memorized chapter james chapter 1 and that's got about 27 verses and so I, I go through all of that. Now, it took me many months to memorise it, but now it's in my brain. And on Saturday morning, I'm going to show you how you can rewire your brain. So I, and in the morning, I think, I think I got to verse 13, and then back into la-la land. So that's how I retrained my body back into more sleep. There's two things that will stop sleep, and that is if you get your phone. Because when your eyes look at your phone... You know what the message is from that light? Daytime, wake up. 80% of Americans sleep with their, home, their phones. I hope no one in here does, because you know the pillow's no protection. So you've got to put that phone out of your room. What if you're on call? Well, you'll hear it from the hallway <laughs> if the phone goes off. So put it out of, out of, your, out of your room. The other thing that will stop sleep is getting annoyed with the fact that you can't sleep. <laughs> so another thing you can do if you can't sleep, if you wake up in the night, is lie there and, and list all the things you're thankful for. I'm so thankful I'm not in a Siberian work camp. I'm so glad I'm not in a concentration camp and I was tortured today. I'm so glad I have feet that work. I'm so glad. You just go through everything that you can be thankful for. The Bible says in Philippians, it says, I have learned in all states that I am in to be content. So I didn't particularly want to go to Mexico for two weeks. In fact, I love it here. I love the height and the cool air, but Cancun, the air's not that great. But you know what I decided to do? Be very thankful to God. My vitamin D levels are nice and high. I got to know some of the staff. We became good friends. I found this great little Italian restaurant that treated me like family every time I entered and made me some beautiful food. So you just love where you're at. And a wonderful de-stressor is to love the moment. Just love this moment. Love where you are. I love the fact that it's getting dusk. It's just a nice temperature right now. I really love this flower arrangement. This is a very nice church. I'm enjoying my new friends. Can you see what you do? You just love this. And when you love this, past pain fades and future worries don't seem so bad. Oh, yes, I hear that 35,000 Australians can't get home. Oh, yes, I hear that I might have trouble getting home. Do you know I don't even think about that? I don't even think about that. I just concentrate on the now. So I love that verse where the Bible says, I have learned, got to learn it. <laughs> I have learned that in all states that I am in, to be content. And what helps you do this is 1 Thessalonians 5.18 that says, in everything give thanks. <laughs> in fact, the preceding verses say, rejoice every more, evermore, Pray without ceasing and in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Father in heaven, I'm so glad I can't sleep because now I can talk to you. <laughs> so these are ways to train you back into sleep because we need that sleep. We need it to prevent sickness and we need it to heal. Exercise is important, but I'm so weak. I haven't eaten for days with this COVID flu. We'll just go on a nice walk. So you just do what you can. 
Just do what you're able. But right in the middle of the day, maybe do some gentle walks and have lots of little rests. But just exercise as much as you can. Once the body starts moving, you'll certainly feel better. And your lungs will get more oxygen, and oxygen's the most vital element needed for life. What do you eat when you're sick? What do you eat when you've got a cold or a flu or COVID? You don't need to eat very much at all. In fact, if you don't eat anything, that's perfectly fine. Because it takes 1,200 calories to digest a meal. And if you're not digesting a meal, all of those calories, that energy, can go to other parts of the body to actually start repairing and rebuilding and cleansing. Because remember, you're going through a cleanse when you have the cold or a flu or a COVID flu. So just eat lightly. You might just have some fruit. If you've got a juicy, you might make yourself some vegetable juices. You might just cook some hot soup. So just go lightly. A lady contacted me and she said, my little boy is not well, he's got a fever, he's coughing, he's not eating. I said, fantastic. <laughs> the fever will get him better real quick. And he's sleeping all day. I said, praise God. Can you see that little body knows what to do? He'll eat again. <laughs> the fever will go. <laughs> He'll start running around again. And after he'd been through a whole week of that, she said, oh, he's starting to eat now. But you know what this mother said to me halfway through it? Barbara, I'm going to go to the gastroenterologist because I think he's got pancreatitis. I said, where'd you get that one from? Pancreatitis? Wow. He's only seven. <laughs> How often does he get the pain? Oh, just now and then. I said, just. I said, you know what that little boy needs to see when you walk in the room? Not a frown. Because if a child sees a frown, you know what he thinks? This must be really bad. <laughs> when you walk in, smile. Even if you're terribly worried, you can smile. Just. <laughs> you can even smile while you're crying. Try it. <laughs> Just smile. Just smile. Do you know what was interesting? She cancelled she canceled the gastroenterologist appointment. Now, I know you have to be cautious. If the child's in a lot of pain, certainly go and check them out. Certainly do that. If you're at all concerned, yes, check them out. And, and when you realise there's not a great problem and the doctor wants to give the child some drugs, you know what you say? You take the script and you say, thank you so much for your advice. I'm going to seriously consider this. You go home and you give him a poultice. <laughs> But you always watch that the body's responding. So I knew that I could say that to this mother. She'd already taken the child to three doctors, and the three doctors had already said there's nothing wrong with the child. So that's why I knew that, that I think it, the mother had to calm down. The mother had to calm down. If your child's screaming with pain, please take him and have him checked out. Absolutely. But sometimes the child will feed off the mother. That's why mother, even if you're terribly concerned, smile. Smile like an idiot. The, ch the, ch the child will, even if you walk out of the room and they just cry and then come back in and smile again. That, that's what you've got to do because that, that settles the child. It, it, will, it will settle the child. So it's very important, the, the uh, emotional and mental aspect of disease. So every, whatever happens, thank God. Say, Father, thank you so much that this is happening to me. I know there's a purpose, and I know I'll be stronger for it, and I know that I'm going to learn a lot of things through this. So what can a person do if they uh, have a bad cough? So there's a couple of things you can do for a, a cough. You can make an onion cough syrup. And the onion cough syrup is very easy to make. So here's a jar, and you put one layer of chopped onion, so that would be about half an inch. Then you put a heaped spoonful of honey, then another a layer of chopped onion, then another big teaspoon of honey, then another layer of chopped onion, and then another teaspoon of honey, another chopped onion until you fill your jar. Now, even if the honey, and the honey that we use is candied honey, you know, it's raw honey, so it's, <laughs> you almost have to dig it out. You can even make it with that. And what you'll find in 24 hours, 
In 24 hours, it'll look like this. You'll have your pile of chopped onion there, uh, and, uh, and you'll have a fluid. And what you do is you strain the onion out, and so you'll be then left with maybe about a third of a jar of uh, onion syrup. Maybe a bit more, depends. There's your onion syrup. So how do you take that? You take a teaspoon three times a day for a little 10-year-old, uh, might be half a teaspoon three times a day. It tastes very nice. It'll, it'll keep almost indefinitely in the fridge. So there's your onion syrup. And there's something else that you can do with onion, and this is particularly good. By the way, if someone's coughing in the night, one of the best things is a pinch of Celtic salt and a glass of water. And then you might give them the onion syrup, but always try the salt and the water first. But you can get one onion and you can chop it up into little squares and divide it into two. And then you get a cloth. So every time you get a sheet that's starting to wear out, tear it up into cloths for your poultice box. And you'll put chopped onion about that much. So this is lots of chopped, chopped onion in little squares. And then you put the foot on top of that. And then you pull the cloth around and then put, a, put that in a plastic bag. And then you twist the twist it round the ankle and put a sock on. The plastic bag will just stop the onion juice going everywhere and, and keep it from uh, chilling, which the air on the wet could chill. And then you go to bed. How easy is that? I was with my daughter a few years ago and her little three-year-old was coughing, had a bad cough. She gave him a hot foot bath and that settled him down a little bit and wrapped him up and put him to bed, and he coughed, and he coughed, and he coughed. And we thought, you'll he'll, he'll go sleep in a minute. But half an hour later, he's still coughing, so we got him up. We made him three-year-old size. Three-year-old size would be about this big. And we made two onion poultices for his feet. Remember, the foot goes straight on the chopped onion. Put him back to bed, not one cough was just incredible. No cough for the whole night. Now, the air in the room smells a bit oniony, <laughs> but no one minds when you sleep. So in the morning, of course, you just discard that. What happens when you chop an onion? You start to cry, is that right? The onion is particularly good at uh, decongesting the, the, uh, the eustachian tubes, the, the sinus, the... Uh, the chest, the throat, all that whole area, the nasal cavities. And the biggest pores in the whole of the body are on the soles of the feet. And so that, that absorbs it quite well. I had a friend who was in a, she was camping by, a, by the sea, which is easy to do in Australia. We have lovely big coastline. And there were other tents around, and the lady in the next tent was coughing. Just coughed nearly all night. I think she just about kept the whole campground awake. So my friend, the next afternoon, she went up to the girl and she said, excuse me, I hope you don't mind me approaching you, but um, you seem to have a cold. She said, I'm so sorry, I don't know what to do. I'm coughing all night, I'm probably keeping everyone awake. My friend said, um, can I make a suggestion? So she's camping, everyone's got an onion when they camp. She had some plastic bags, she, she made it up. She said, just put your foot in the plastic bag, make sure your feet are on top of the onion, twist it round, put a sock on. No, not one cough the whole night. You almost can't wait to try it, can you? <laughs> so it, it not only brings relief, and what you'll find with the natural treatments is that they not only bring relief, but they also um, boost healing. Because remember, your feet are a reflex, yes, for, for abdomen and for chest and, and for the head. So different treatments done on the, on the feet can, can help with this. 
Now this one I'm about to give you is specifically for babies. And that is garlic on the bottom of the feet. Now you can put onion straight on the bottom of the feet, but you can't put garlic straight on the skin. If you put garlic straight on the skin, the skin will blister. So what, and of course most people can take the flu bomb, they're getting garlic that way, but what about a little baby if a little baby gets a cold? You can get a strip of cloth. So again, this is great to cut up your old sheets and do this, a strip of cloth, and I finely slice finely slice garlic, so you might just have two slices, very fine, and then you put the cloth over that and then bind it on the feet. So there's a layer of cloth between the sliced garlic and the baby's skin, and then you put a little sock on, or we, I knit little booties for babies. And it takes one minute for one drop of blood to go around the whole body. So what you'll find is within a few minutes, she can smell it on the baby's breath. <laughs> so what will the garlic do? Remember Psalm 104 verse 14, where the Bible says that God gave herbs for the service of man. So those herbs are there to serve you. And remember the action of the garlic is antibiotic, antifungal, antimicrobial. So if the baby has a head cold or a, or a chest cold and you wrap this garlic on the bottom of their feet, then the blood takes the garlic right where it needs to. One lady rang me up. She said, Barbara, I, my second baby is 10 months old and has been pulling at the ear and has got really chest, chesty and head cold and lots of green mucus coming out. She said, I've just gone to the doctor. He's given me a course of antibiotics for the baby. She said, I'm ringing you up because my first child, who is now five, I took him to the doctor probably every month. He had about four or five courses of antibiotics every year. She said, he's always sick. He's got all these allergies, and I heard that you raised six children without any drugs. Yeah, and they're all still alive. <laughs> and they're doing it to their, their children. Michael and I have 21 grandchildren now, so they're all used to all of these ways. So my children grew up with this, so for them, whenever they get sick, it's just the first thing they think of. Anyway, I said to her, is the baby breastfed? She said, yes. I said, is the baby having any food at the moment? She said, oh, he's gone off his food. I said, good, don't give him any food. I said, you can steam up an onion on the stove. If you steam up an onion on the stove, you can steam it or dry bake it. If you boil the onion, some of the healing properties will go into the water. So a whole onion and you keep the skin on and that end on, it'll hold it together. Steam it till it's soft, and then cut it. It'll be very hot. And you pick up the onion in a cloth, and you squeeze it, and you'll get a little bit of juice out. This is the cooked onion. And that hot onion juice will go into a cold spoon, and then be the right temperature. And you can put that in the baby's ear, a bit of the cooked onion juice. And then you can wrap the cloth around around the onion and get it just to the temperature that's right and put it on the baby's ear. It's a good idea to do it when the baby's about to have a feed because the baby will let you to do anything to them when they're having a feed and then the baby will often fall asleep and what you've got to make sure is that that poultice is kept warm. You don't want it to chill so you might put plastic over it or I remember when one of my sons had an earache and he fell asleep with the onion, I laid him on the onion. So I had several layers of towel and I knew that that would keep, keep it warm. I know when I did this to my son, he slept for two hours. Do children sleep for two hours if they've got an earache? Not usually, it brought incredible relief. I said, do that to the baby, but I said also, wrap. So before you do that, while the onion's cooking, do some fine slices of garlic, wrap it over and wrap it on the bottom of the baby's feet. And then when the onion's ready and you get that just the right temperature, put it on the baby's ear, feed the baby and the baby will, uh, will sleep. 
She was so excited because she'd been walking half the night with the baby and the baby slept soundly. She said, yeah, I've got pen and paper, now what else? I said, oh, that'll, that'll be enough. She said, nothing else? I said, no, that, that, that should be all right. She said, um, what about me? Should I do anything because I'm breastfeeding? I said, oh, you can take a bit of excess vitamin C if you want. She rang me three days later, and when I answered the phone, she said, wow. <laughs> she said, my baby recovered quicker than my other son ever did on the antibiotics. <laughs> she said, I'm sold. So it's a pity that a mother has to go through that to find out that there is a much easier way, a much easier way. And I... I think that it's, um, it's always a tragedy that someone has to go through a difficult situation before they look at natural ways. And the Bible talks about this. It talks about this in Psalm 119, verse 67. It says, Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I have kept thy word. In other words, before I was sick, before there was anything wrong with me, I did what I want. I ate what I want, I partied all night, but now that I'm sick, now I have decided to learn, well, what, what should I do? What should I do to keep, keep the body in good working order? So God designed the body with an inbuilt ability to heal itself, and the first lecture certainly showed you that when we look at our absolutely phenomenal immune system. And so it makes sense to me that the best way to bring about a healing response in the body is to work with the body's own healing system. And that's what my daughter did when her whole family got COVID and she was creating fevers. And yet, isn't it incredible when I was a nurse, if anyone had a fever, we did everything we could to get the fever down. It doesn't make any sense, does it? And then it'd come up again, so we'd do everything. What you've got to find, what you've got to think about is, why is it there? What, why has the body created this fever? And it's created the fever for a purpose. And these natural remedies help to work with the body in its healing process. There are some herb teas that can be very helpful too. So when someone's got a cold or a flu or COVID, they can have peppermint tea. Peppermint tea can be very good at clearing the chest. Also ginger tea. We looked at ginger in the, in the flu bomb. Lemongrass tea can be very nice. Or you can even put all of them together. And that helps also with the hydration. What about sinus? What if someone has sinus problems? I used to have terrible sinus problems. Every time I got a cold, I would have a terrible headache from the congestion in my sinus. I discovered the cause of this years later, and there were two causes. One was I was still having dairy products and I had an allergy to dairy. Number two was I wasn't drinking enough water. I was pregnant or breastfeeding nonstop for 14 years, and I used to drink two, sometimes three glasses of water a day. I used to hate traveling because I always got a headache. I, I don't get headaches anymore because I discovered my problem was dehydration. And I don't get sinus anymore. My problem was I had an allergy and I was dehydrated. Remember the five allergens? <laughs> they are some of the main causes of a sinus problem. The body's reacting to something. That's why it's creating all that mucus. So whenever anyone has excess mucus, you've got to put your detective hat on. What, why is the body reacting like this? What's, what, what is irritating it? And mine was that I wasn't, had an allergy and I also was dehydrated. We had a near nose and throat specialist nurse to our program. And she said, you wouldn't believe the green slime that we pull out of sinuses. And she said, and all the specialists agree, it's fungus. Fungus up in the sinuses? 
And then I was reading in one of my books, I've got a book and it's called uh, Clinical Mycology. Mycology is another name for the study of fungus and fungal problems in the body. And I was reading that in the 1990s, a group of scientists in the Mayo Clinic discovered that the number one cause of sinus was fungus. Up in here, where does mold and fungus live in our houses? In the dark, moist areas, is that right? Same with the human body. <laughs> when there's a dark, moist area up in here. But what starts it is the allergy. So when you get that excess mucus sitting around there, then the fungus starts to develop. So what can we do to clear sinus? Because that can be an incredibly painful situation. Stop the five allergens. Remember the five allergens? Peanuts, dairy, hybridized wheat, your oats, and your refined sugar. But it can take can take a couple of months to see a response there. And then you can start cleaning out the sinuses. So how do we clean them out? There's a herb that's very effective. And this herb is golden seal. Now golden seal has a nickname. Golden seal is king of tonics to all mucous membranes. And so wherever you've got mucous membrane, the golden seal, has a tonic or healing effect. In fact, we give it to people that have uh, urinary tract infections. It comes out in their urine and it can heal there. We give it to people to wash their eyes with if they've got eye problems. We give it to people to rinse their mouth with if they've got ulcers. Wherever you've got mucus, it can bring about healing. To all mucous membranes, it's king of tonics. But there's something else that golden seal has. It's anti-staphylococcic. Now, there's hardly a drug that would, will kill golden staph. Isn't that true? But golden seal will. It's anti-staph... Low... So it's wide range antimicrobial, absolutely antifungal, antiviral, antibacterial. I mention the anti staphylococcus because hardly anything will touch that. Now it's a very expensive herb, it's a root, and once the golden seal is planted it takes seven years to grow to harvest and they're fine little roots. So it's very difficult to grow. Apparently it'll only grow in forest floors. Maybe it'll grow up here. You've got some good forests. But you can get golden seal, so be prepared that it is quite expensive. And ideally you buy it as a fine powder and you sniff it up into the sinus area. Now only sniff lightly, just tiny little sniffs. Don't sniff hard or you'll feel like the top of your head's going to explode. And apparently, in the days of snuff, they used to put a little bit on the, you know, in that little dip you see. If you make a fist, you'll see a tiny dip there. Well, you put a little bit there, go to the mirror and put your nostril there and sniff a little bit, then another little bit and sniff it. Don't breathe out or that beautiful gold dust will blow away and it's expensive. So blow out, then sniff up. And what the golden seal will do is it'll go up into the sinus areas. It has a tonic effect. It has an antifungal, antimicrobial effect up there. And when you taste bitterness in the back of your throat, you know it's hit its mark. Try not to blow your nose for about 10, 15 minutes. You might be a little bit tinkly. But we have seen people heal their sinus problems by doing this. Again, first of all, you've got to stop the cause. But after many years of having sinus problems, uh, it might take a few months to, to start to clear out the residue. But it's very nice being able to breathe again, and it's very nice not having to suffer from that very painful, painful sinus, sinus problem. 
So let me tell you the story of a lady that came to our retreat. She came to our retreat a few years ago now and she was late 30s. And when I consulted with her, I discovered that she didn't drink much water and she was on daily painkillers for a headache and sinus pain. She said, I've been suffering for years and years. And I discovered that she loved dairy and wheat and peanut butter and <laughs> all the halogens. So, of course, she didn't have them at the retreat. And we showed her magnificent ways to eat without having to eat these things. And she started to sniff the golden seal. It took a little bit before she mastered the art, but she, I said, well, she said to me, how often do I do it? I said, as much as you want. I mean, if you've got sinus pain, you might do it every two hours. But if you're working and it's not too bad and you're just in a maintenance program, you might do it every morning, every night, just whatever, whatever works for you. A year later, we started a program and this lovely looking young woman came in, slim, beautifully dressed. She smiled, I smiled back. She said, do you remember me? I said, I'm trying. <laughs> it was that woman. It was that same woman. She had lost, I'd say, easy 20 pound. She was smiling. She said, I have some stories for you. She said, I have no more sinus problems. She said, I have not taken a painkiller for a whole year. She said, I am feeling fantastic. She said, stopping those foods, I was a bit hesitant at first because I like them. But she said, I did not want to suffer from that pain anymore. She said, I have not had a headache for a whole year. She said to me, my mother was getting very worried because my mother reckoned I was losing too much weight. She said, I have to tell you, I'm very happy with it. I'm very happy with my size now. But my mother kept saying to me, I can't be healthy. It can't be healthy what you're doing. You should be eating meat to get your protein and you should be drinking milk to get your calcium. You've heard all of that stuff. Do the, do the, uh, do the elephants drink milk to get their strong bones? <laughs> no, you'll find all, the, all the, the strongest boned creatures on the planet are all vegetarians. They're getting it from their greens. So she said, I went to the doctor and I had an extensive blood test done and the doctor came back and he said, I don't know what you're doing, young woman, but this is the healthiest looking blood I have seen for years. <laughs> so she said to me, I, I just want to thank you. She said, I, I just have a, a new lease on life. But how simple were the, the simple things that she implemented to bring about that healing condition? So what I wanted to do in this presentation, I wanted to show you some simple treatments that you can do if you get the cold or flu or COVID. I also wanted to assure you that there is no need to fear COVID because most people recover and they will recover much quicker if they knew these natural treatments. So I'd like to open the floor now for questions. So if anyone has any questions, we have time to answer. We have a roving mic here to be able to, uh, to hear your question. You could say it loudly and I'll repeat it. Oregon grape? Yeah, is that comparable to a golden seal? I'm not familiar with Oregon grape. The question is, is Oregon grape similar to this? I am not sure. Okay. So I've had a few people say yes, so maybe it is. It's not something I'm familiar with. It's cheaper. It's cheaper. <laughs> Grows wild. Sounds good. So... I have allergies when I am, especially mowing, doing yard work. Yeah. It'll go, and when, I, and when it hits me, it'll be a couple of days, I'm down, headaches, yeah. blowing the nose. Yeah. 
I'll tell you something interesting about allergies, and I've seen this many times. When people stop the five known allergens, their uh, allergy to the pollen goes, their allergy to dust mite goes, their allergy to the, the cut grass goes. Isn't that interesting? Because they stop the, the five allergens. But remember that it can take a couple of months once it's stopped, so it's worthwhile trying that. Um, have you also included in your bomb uh, grapefruit seed extract? Grapefruit seed extract is very powerful. It's one of the most powerful antifungal ones, and that could be an alternative to the eucalyptus oil. That's true. The other question is, what can you do for your eyes? I remember seeing a video one time where a guy had problems with his eyes, and he took it. To, he went to Mexico, and they put rose petals in the water. <laughs> and the lady turned it upside down on his eyes and it helped his eyes out. And I'm noticing a lot of, it just feels like dirt in my eyes and, you know, I put uh, clear eyes in there and a bunch of other stuff. And then we're, it's, our eyes are getting kind of, you know, fuzzier. <laughs> There's a few things you can do for eyes. Here's a tea mix you can do. So we do half a teaspoon of the uh, golden seal, or it sounds like grape Oregon, is that right? And also half a teaspoon of eye bright. Eye bright is a herb that can be used for any eye problems. So you would put uh, one cup of boiling water on that and let it, let it cool and then get a little eye bath and uh, wash the eye with that a couple of times a day. That's an excellent recipe for any eye problem. Uh, I've seen people with dry eyes, it's helped with that. Uh, I have a question. Um, what can you tell someone when they say to you, oh, well, your immune system, you know, it's not all that it should be, you know, because of sin in the world, because our, the human race is not as strong as it used to be, and a whole lot of other reasons. And they say, well, the immune system is not functioning the way that it was intended to function. Well, what you've got to remember is that anyone can say anything. <laughs> and you can also say, well, that's an interesting opinion, but that's not my opinion. And if immune systems aren't functioning properly, you've got to find out why. Because you, as you've seen by what I've shown you tonight, if you give it the right conditions, it will function very well. I have a question. Uh, uh, do you have a remedy for toenail fungus? Yes. Now there's a book out there called Self Heal by Design. <laughs> and that book goes through the uh, basic programs that you can put yourself on to help eliminate fungus out of your body because it is an internal systemic problem. But some people will go through that program and find that they still have fungal toenails, so you need to actually do something to the toenails as well. So what you can do, and this gentleman mentioned grapefruit seed extract. This is not grape seed extract, this is grapefruit seed extract. He's one of the strongest antifungal um, mixtures that we have. Probably almost equal to it would be oregano essential oil. But both of those are a little bit strong to put neat onto toenails. You could, and that will burn the toenail out and the toenail will fall off, so you might want to do that. But probably a gentler one to do is to put, uh, uh, put about, you might put, say, six drops of coconut oil to one drop of grapefruit seed extract or one drop of oregano essential oil and uh, put that on the toenails a couple of times a day. I have a question about um, using the garlic on, on your foot, and especially for children. I used it many years ago, and it burned. So I it don't will. know, could the coconut oil be it will, helpful it will, with that? It will burn, and it will cause a blister. 
It did, yes. Yeah. And it lasted like a week or two. And that's why you put the cloth between and the, I did. Okay. the garlic. I have used it many times on my babies and my grandbabies, and it's never caused a blister because I put a cloth there. So a cloth is enough to prevent it. A cloth that. is enough. Thank yeah. you. We've got a few hands over this way too. Down here. <laughs> There's a few on the way too. Yeah, my uh, little, my five-year-old here want me to briefly share his testimony to the onion. And uh, he was born with a cleft lip and a cleft lip and pilot, and his eustachian tubes was constantly always open. And um, the doctor told us that he would have get a lot of antibiotics because he would get infections in his ear. And so there was another lady who had a daughter who had the same problem, and she was there every week getting antibiotics. And so my wife and I, we decided against doing that, and we decided to take the onion and heat it up, as you were saying, and also squeeze the juice in, and uh, both ears, and lay him on uh, uh, one side one day and the other side the next. And so he never got an infection. Sometimes mm. the food would get in, because it was open when he would chew and stuff like that. And uh, when he got a blockage, sometimes he couldn't hear because uh, the blockage would be there. But we put the onion on, and it drew the fluid out, and the fluid was on uh, the paper towel. And so the, the doctor wanted to know what we was doing, why we never came in, and why his ears were so clear, and how he could hear <laughs> better. And uh, they wanted to put in his ears um, the little uh, tubes to drain Promise. fluid out, yeah. and so we was against it, and so we didn't do it, and he thought we was crazy. And so uh, we continued with the onion, and he never had a problem. <laughs> and they was amazed, and so and to this day, he has no problem, and we no longer use the onion. That's a fantastic story, isn't it? Thank you very much for that. Hello. Um, we went vegan about uh, two years ago now, and maybe a year ago, um, I got a saliva stone in my jaw, and it, it swells up if I eat, and then recently I had to go on antibiotics and steroids to get it to calm down, and now they want to do surgery to cut it out, and so I've been doing castor oil packs on it. Um, but I'm wondering if there's anything else I can do to avoid there having that surgery. There certainly is. And um, you can massage the area with castor oil. You can put castor oil packs on there. And you can oil pull. And that's very effective. And that's coconut oil, a spoonful of coconut oil in your mouth. And you swish it. Swish it all around for about 10 minutes. Okay. So you might swish for 10 seconds, rest for 10 seconds, swish for 10 seconds. And after that, you release it out on the grass. Don't release it down. You don't call it a plug hole, do you? You call it sinkhole. Is that right? Yeah. Don't, because I said plug hole before and no one knew what I was talking about. The drain. The drain. Don't put it down the drain because the coconut oil will go solid and block up your drain. So release it outside. And take water with you, rinse your mouth, and release that out. In fact, if I was you, I would do that. I would massage castor oil in a couple of times a day on the outside, and I would oil pull about three times a day. And you might just find that you'll conquer it by doing that. OK, so they did a CT scan on it, where they um, inject the, what is it called? The dye, the radioactive dye, so they can see it. So they said it was like three millimeters. Hmm. Um, and I noticed after we had the test done, I felt pretty sick. So is there anything that you can do to like flush that? Yeah, toxin I don't, out of don't, your body? don't have any more antibiotics and don't have any more tests. Um, if you oil pull, that pulls that waste out. Yeah. So the oil pull will not only uh, have an antibacterial effect in the mouth, the oil pulling will pull waste out of the tongue. It will also pull waste out of the glands and blood vessels under the tongue. Oil pulling is a fantastic way to uh, keep a good environment in your mouth. 
Yeah. With the use of uh, golden seal on a chronic basis, have you had concerns or seen depression? Um, my understanding is if you use golden seal for two weeks, and that may be just the ingestion, that you would have uh, potential for depression. Have no, seen? never. Never. I have never seen that. In fact, that's a wild claim, isn't it? That golden seal can cause depression. I have never seen that, no. And I also don't know how that could happen. Would you use oil pulling uh, also for cancer in the mouth? Absolutely, okay. absolutely. And for cancer in the mouth, I would suggest oil pulling a few times a day. And I would also suggest rinsing with sodium bicarbonate and holding the sodium bicarbonate in the mouth for as long as possible, even just before going to bed and just release it before you go to sleep. Because cancer loves an acid environment and sodium bicarbonate alkalizes the environment. How long would you do that? Hold it. Just how long would you hold it? Try and hold it for about 10 minutes. Mm. Mm. Can you address um, mold issues? I have an employee who spent 12 years in a foreign country on missions and he was exposed to a great deal of mold. Um, so he suffers a lot and he's not at he does not understand what to do about it. This is a very serious problem. It's such a serious problem, I've written a book on the subject. And, and my book addresses that, and it addresses the, uh, the history of mould. And I'm amazed at how it's something that medicine doesn't want to know about. And I think medicine resists... Uh, discussing the fungal effect with disease because a lot of medicines, drugs, put it into the body. That's what an antibiotic does. And so you'll find my book helpful. If we sell out, my daughter's sent, sending another box, so we should have a few more coming. Is there a way to detox from the COVID vaccine? Is there a way to detox from the COVID vaccine? That's a very good question. Unfortunately, there is not. And one of the reasons is that the COVID vaccine is not like any vaccine that has ever been made. It does not have FDA approval, even though they claim that it does, because it takes 15 years to go through all the tests to get approval. Now, one of the problems with the COVID vaccine is that they, it's got a spike protein in it, and that spike protein causes our immune system to attack COVID, but in that process, it disarms our immune system to be able to fight anything else. But also, what they're finding is that this spike protein is causing nano-sized clots. And that is something that they didn't expect it to do. In fact, I was listening to a, uh, to a presentation by the man who created this, and he, he's blowing the whistle on it and saying that this is dangerous, but I'm afraid they're not listening to him. So these na a nano size is a size that cannot be measured. So these nano size clots can get lodged in the brain, so that's a contributing factor to Alzheimer's, and also especially in the lungs. You might have seen, it was in the newspaper probably six months ago, that where there were something like 15 people in an aged care facility in the Netherlands who were all given the COVID vaccine and they all died straight away, and it was from this clotting in the, in the lungs. My daughter Jessica is 40 and she rang me distressed a month ago, she said, Mum, my girlfriend's husband has just died. He was given the COVID vaccine, he got a terrible headache, and he was dead in 24 hours. In Australia so far, there are 455 deaths to the vaccine. When I was in Mexico, I met a lady, and she just told me that her brother just had the vaccine in Africa and died. She said, we've got thousands of deaths in Africa now to the vaccine. She said, we think that they're experimenting on us. So these are things that you do not hear in the media. So this vaccine is very dangerous. And here's another lady I met in the pool in Mexico. She, she, uh, she was a lady who 
Her and her husband ma manage rock groups, so she's a bit of a rough lady, had blue and green hair and tattoos all over her. Nice lady, we chatted. She said, yeah, I had the vaccine two weeks ago. She didn't know who I was and I wasn't, but we weren't really discussing it. She said, and I went through the security and all the security bell went off on the arm where I got the vaccine. Oh. She laughed. I, I can't laugh at that. So I don't know whether you've heard that I've heard of people putting magnets that stick on their arms after the vaccine, and that sounds far-fetched. You, you listen to all of these things, and that's why God says, I've not given you the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So I'm very sorry to say that there, there is no detoxing from this vaccine. It is uh, incredibly dangerous. And they're saying now that one's not enough. Then they said, well, now we have to have two. The latest is we have to have three now. So that defies reason. It, what's the definition of insanity? <laughs> to, to keep doing it and expect a different result. I know that a third of the new cases in Australia, the positive cases, have all been vaccinated. So the vaccine seems to even give you the COVID. I just had an email from a lady. She said, my mother, she had two COVID vaccines. She's never had heart problems in her life. And she said twice a week, she's rushed to hospital with heart palpitations since she's had the vaccine. Mm. So it seems to have a slightly different effect on, on different people. And some people have the vaccine and don't appear to have a reaction to it. But these nanoparticles building up in the body, that suggests that there could be major problems in about three years in the area of lung disease and in the area of mental disease. So please thank God every day that you live in Idaho because on top of this, people wearing masks all day, breathing in their own waste, the, the lungs are going to go down. So uh, Idaho is a nice place to be. This, this all sounds terrible, and I'm sorry that I can't paint a, a pretty picture with it. But if they say to me, you cannot go back to Australia and yet let you're vaccinated, I, I will not go back to Australia because this is a very dangerous vaccine. So I take heart when I hear that England has had to scrap the, the vaccine passport, which was going to be you can't even fly without the vaccine. Let's hope that it stays the way as it is, which is you can only fly if you've had vaccine. You've had... Or you, I mean, if you've got the vac had the vaccine, had COVID, or you have a COVID test, that, that is the fairest way to do it, if they're going to do it. I prefer that they would scrap the whole lot. But probably to, vac to, to detox, uh, basically keeping the eight laws of health, and green barley or barley green. You can get barley green powder, you can get super greens, and it's one of the best blood and tissue cleansers there is. So that, that may help. You can take green barley three times a day and you might find that that will help to mop up some of the damage. I was wondering um, if um, you've had experience with French green clay with detoxing. With French green clay, with detoxing, I do know that green clay has has the ability to pull uh, poisons and waste out of the body. Uh, also the French green clay can do it, and the betonite clay can also do it. And also charcoal has the ability to, um, to take in and detoxify uh, environmental poisons. That is true. Yes? What do you think the bottom line of this vaccination craze is? Do you think it's uh, depopulation? Do you think it's control? Do you think it's tons of money for pharmaceutical companies or a combination of all three? Uh, th they're very interesting questions. <laughs> and I do not know. <laughs> uh, I cannot say but uh, it, it just doesn't sound good. And when one looks at what's happening on the planet, one comes to the conclusion that there must be more than meets the eye with this. And Bible prophecy tells us that the world will spiral down before Jesus comes. So 
it's, a, it's, it's not crystal clear where it's all heading at the moment. But what I do know is that we have an amazing immune system that has an ability to heal us and it does not need vaccines. Vaccines do not heal us. Vaccines have never healed us. Vaccines have never prevented disease. And we are wise, if at all possible, to stay away from the vaccine. I choose not to. And please remember, it is your God-given right to choose what goes into your body. There's a question up the back, yeah? Yeah. My question is concerning autoimmune diseases. If somebody has systemic lupus, what, what are the things that they have to do not watch out for? Autoimmune diseases. Do you know God never designed the body to eat itself? God never designed the body for the, its immune system to start attacking the body. And so it's important to investigate the person that has lupus and find out what could have come together to cause this and begin giving the body the conditions to boost the immune system so that it starts to function as God planned that it to function. Every case is different. See, if someone has, if 10 people have lupus, it may not be the same thing that you would do to each. So with each case, you look at their history, you look at the person, and you look at what can be done to bring about healing there. Thank you. Um, I believe it's clear that people that have been treating their bodies properly, you know, according to God, they may not have to worry about COVID as much, but like you mentioned your, your son-in-law that has some pre-existing conditions. My mother, she told me yesterday she just enjoyed a lovely pot roast and some potatoes, and I'm like, oh. You know, so if you know people are eating like that, then maybe they should be more afraid. Uh, obviously, they should be more afraid of COVID. Um, should they then go to the hospital more quickly, not, not be content to stay at home? Uh, if I had COVID and if I knew someone who was not well and had COVID, I would not advise they go to the hospital because I don't believe that they have any answers. So, yeah, that's a difficult one. One, one would just hope that, remember that psalm I gave you, Psalm 119, verse uh, 67, it's, before I was afflicted, I went astray. <laughs> Sometimes people don't stop and listen and start giving their body the right conditions and, until they get sick. But is it too late at that point? You know what I mean? Somebody gets COVID. Well, you've probably heard that it's almost a death sentence to go on the ventilator. Right. Yeah, so... I don't know, what, what are they going to do? You, if someone is, gets very sick and wants to go to the hospital, that, that is their choice. Just as it is my choice not to go, it is their choice to go. I respect everyone's choice. And I so appreciate it when people respect my choice. <laughs> my question is about last night's uh, lecture. Um, and you stressed... Um, how good beans and the legume family is for us. Um, what do you recommend to keep um, from giving a lot of body gas? It's a very good question. It's a very good question. There's a book called Nourishing Traditions by Sally Fallon. And she looks at the way people used to prepare beans. You know what they did? They soaked them all night. Sometimes they soak them 24 hours and they rinse them about every eight hours. And then they rinse them very well. Then they brought them to the boil and rinsed them again. You know when you bring it to the boil and there's all that froth? You're looking at the wind. <laughs> there it is. What I like to do is I like to put the pot under the tap, put put the tap on so the water comes out and let all that froth come away, let it all come away. So there is a way to prepare beans so that the wind problem is not so much. I saw a lady once 
cook onions and then carrots and then put the water in and then opened a packet and poured the legumes straight in and I thought, oh dear, everyone that eats that soup's going to have a lot of trouble. <laughs> So what do you do when you make a soup? Well, you bring your, your legumes to the boil in another pot and then you rinse them and rinse them again and then you can put them in with your soup. If you find you still have some wind, then you bring it right back to where you don't have wind. Maybe you have a teaspoon of lentils a day. And then as your body handles that, have two teaspoons a day. So slowly build up your body to get used to it. What is your thought on ivermectin? What is my thought on ivermectin? Personally, I would not choose to have ivermectin because of the things that I've shown you tonight that can heal a body. But I do hear that in India they're having great results with ivermectin, but I also know that in India they don't drink enough water and they live in filth. So maybe if they drank more water and didn't live in filth, they wouldn't even need ivermectin. But I do acknowledge, appreciate, and understand that in some cases they're finding ivermectin helps. I have a question regarding um, if you've got somebody that has a lot of earwax problems and their ear gets um, pretty um, stuffed up, what, what would be a natural remedy for that? Uh, hydrogen peroxide is very good. What you do is you put a teaspoon in boiling water and then you pour the hydrogen peroxide onto the hot spoon and it brings the hydrogen peroxide up to a lukewarm and then you can pour that in and it fizzes, fizzes all up. That's a very old remedy. Sometimes people find uh, doing the same with coconut oil. Remember, put the spoon in boiling water, then put the coconut oil on that. It'll melt and warm and... and put that in. You try, try different things. Sometimes just being in the shower and just letting the hot water from the shower run into the ears each night and then massaging that area can do it. Somebody asked a question about um, Idahoans not being able to get vitamin D here in the winter time and being told that there's no access to vitamin D here. Does the vitamin D from the summer stay in the body? through the winter time or is what are our alternatives other than leaving? The, the body stores vitamin D very well. And also the sunflower, what does the sunflower follow? Is the sun, so the sunflower seeds have some vitamin D in them. And there is a little bit of sunshine in the winter, you've just got it whenever you see it run out into it. <laughs> Any other questions? So if you're wanting to get vitamin D in the sun, how much of your body needs to be exposed or should you do sunbathing for a little bit in order to get that you know, full body exposure? Well, um, even just having the chest and the arms and the face exposed for you know, 20 minutes a day, you're getting quite good vitamin D. So I have two questions, and the first question is, is it risky to have a newborn baby around vaccinated family members because of the spike protein could shed through the sweat? That's an interesting question. <laughs> because of this spike protein, the only, the only people that can safely fly are unvaccinated, you know. Because when people fly, their clotting factor increases. So they're making a rule. Of, they made, Qantas will not fly anyone unless they're vaccinated. So it is crazy. So I understand what you're saying, and that is a question that is of concern. And there are reports of people, uh, you know, I've heard a few reports of women beginning to menstruate 20 years after they usually menstruate after being with people who've been vaccinated. This isn't just the odd story. These are quite a few stories. So, yes, I, I think that if I was the mother of a newborn baby, I would prefer to keep my baby away from vaccinated people. Yeah, that's a difficult one. 
Thank you. And then the next question is, are you familiar with the solution um, sodium chloride and hydrochloric acid? And what are your thoughts on it? It's my understanding through a little study that I've been doing that is it, it can be a cell builder and pull toxic out. Yes, yeah, sodi sodium chloride, uh, it, uh, it can, and of course it is part of seawater, it is part of uh, the Celtic salt and the Himalayan salt. Uh, hydrochloric acid, I'm, I'm not sure how someone would use that. I know it is a wonderful thing in our stomach. One way to boost hydrochloric acid, I didn't mention this before, it is in my book, is there is an ext extract from beetroot called betaine hydrochloride. In my book, I've got a chapter. It's called The Stomach Secret Weapon, Hydrochloric Acid. So because I, I have discovered is such an amazing substance, I have uh, included that in my book. I have a question regarding osteopenia, osteoporosis. Um, I was finding out, a, have you heard anything about strontium, um, Romans? soldiers and centurions, they tested their bones, they found the graveyard and tested the bones and it's very high in strontium. So they had good care. So have you heard anything about increasing bone density? Um, I, I have not heard that, but I, I do know that people can increase bone density by bone building exercises and the best is the trampoline. And I do understand that bones are made of 12 minerals and 64 trace minerals, and maybe that's one of the trace minerals that's in there. So that's why your green leafy vegetables and your Celtic and Himalayan salt can, uh, can certainly help. A lot of people's bones deteriorate because they're taking things that leach calcium and minerals out, which is your tea, your coffees, your alcohols, <laughs> refined sugars, things like that. Um, what, what would be good for tinnitus? Aha, tinnitus. We've got to go back to this. What's the cause? All rock singers have it because the loud mu rock music they are exposed to damage the fine mechanisms in the ear. Men that have used jackhammers or sometimes men in war who've been exposed to bombs, loud noises, explosives, because those loud noises damage the fine mechanisms in the ear. Uh, another cause of tinnitus can be an allergy. Your eustachian tubes are the tubes that connect your eyes and your ears and your nose and your mouth. So if someone's got sinus problems, uh, that'll often lead to tinnitus because of the blockage in the tube. So stopping the five allergens is important. And also even doing the golden seal sniffing would help to clear the uh, airways so that the ears can also help to be a bit freer there. But what I have found, now I don't know if you have cicadas here. Are you familiar with cicadas? Not here. Well, we have just millions at Misty Mountain. Not every summer, but they're, they're loud. And we have guests come and say, how can you bear the noise? We don't even hear it. And when they say, how can you bear the cicada noise? Then I hear it. It can be the same with tinnitus. You can concentrate on it and it can sound huge or you can distract yourself away from it and barely hear it. It's like someone that lives next to a train line. After a while, they don't even hear the trains. So especially if there has been damage in the ear, you know, you know, that damage is there. But you can learn to live with tinnitus. One more question about vitamin D. The um, blue lights for sad disease, um, can they give you that same UV? Most blue lights are, vit uh, are UVA, not UVB. So your UVB is your better and the one that's required to make the, uh, um, the vitamin D. One or two more questions and got one over here.
Is there any natural remedies for cavities? <laughs> well, there is a book by Nadine Artemis, and uh, she shows how cavities can be healed because the bone can heal. Now, most people are not prepared to do what you've got to do. Uh, Artemis, I think, or Mass, or Artemis, if you get something like that in. Um, holistic uh, Dentistry, I think, uh, or Dental is the title of her book. So what most people do, I think, especially with children, is when there's a little mark, they go and have it drilled and filled too soon. But I remember taking my children to the dentist and she said, your children's teeth astonish me. She said, most of them have no cavities and one of them has, but it's actually started to heal itself. One of the biggest causes of, of cavities or, you know, in the teeth is people do not, they're not aware of oral hygiene. So after every meal, you must rinse your mouth and floss your teeth because there's little bits of food caught between the tooth in that warm environment start to break down. The bacteria and the microbes come and, and start eating it and that starts to affect the, the, uh, the um, dentine covering the teeth. Have you ever flossed your teeth and then smelt it? Yeah. So the, the, it's actually rotten <laughs> happening in there. So if people were aware to rinse their mouth, to floss even the little brushes and oil pull a couple of times a day, they would probably find if it did, a mark did come that it possibly will heal. But there's definitely a, a point where one may need to have um, visit the dentist. But please don't have root canals and please don't have mercury fillings put in. My question's related to the eyes. I just wanted you, if you could, review the um, treatment that you have there. I missed what the GS is. Golden and seal. Oh, golden Sorry. seal. Okay. And then the cup of boiling water, you just steep that. And then... You, you strain it. it. And then strain it and then put the drops in. Yeah. And then get a little eye bath and wash, oh, okay. wash with it. And then the next thing I wanted to ask really quickly. So... How can you correct? I wear glasses. A lot of people do. How can you recover your eyesight? Well, there's a book called Better Eyesight Without Glasses by Dr. William Bates. Written in the 1950s, he nearly lost his license over writing that book. But there, he's got some excellent... What's the title again? Uh, Better Eyesight Without Glasses by Dr. William Bates. Thank you. So we okay. might make this our yeah, last, last question. question. Yeah. Um, I have a question regarding um, what you just said regarding uh, the mercury fillings, and you advise not to get the mercury fillings, but if someone already has mercury, some mercury fillings or a substantial number of mercury fillings in their mouth, uh, what would your advice be? Because also, they have said that, um, dent some dentists have said, well, uh, it's dangerous to remove, get um, mercury fillings removed, especially if the dentist does not have the specialized training to keep the, you know, mercury from spreading or dissipating in the mouth while it's being extracted. So choose your danger. Do you keep them in and keep getting poisoned or do you take the plunge and get them out? I personally took the plunge and got mine out, but you need to go to a biological dentist. That is true. You need to go to a dentist who's aware of the danger and will put the dam in your mouth and make steps to, to reduce your exposure to the mercury as much as possible. Thank you so much, Barbara. We really appreciate it. We will um, hopefully see you all again tomorrow evening. We have...
tonight a and every night that you attend there will be a free book there's also a free book table but the free feature book is always going to be a health book so um, as you leave you can pick up your free book for and one per family because we're not quite sure we'll have enough if everyone takes one so just one per family um, also on the bulletins there is a, a typo on the time for the Sabbath lecture. It says 5 to 8 p.m., but that's that's a typo. So when Barbara speaks on Sabbath morning, it's going to be during our Sabbath school and church service starting at 9.30 a.m., and then she'll be speaking till 12 noon on Saturday Sabbath. So let's have a closing prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we are so blessed to know that you have created us so wonderfully that we can... Um, have the strength that you give us that our bodies are made to heal themselves with all the right um, natural remedies that you provide. And we thank you for this information. We thank you for the wisdom that you're providing. And may you give us the strength that we need in order to implement anything in our lives that we need to change through your strength. Because you say in your word that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us as long as we yield to you. Uh, every decision we make. And I thank you so much. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. Thank you.